You're listening to Big World Network. Phineas Fracture and the Curse of Steamhotep, Episode 6. Written by Joseph Gatch. Read by Michael Young. A mummy's curse? exclaimed Mrs. Popkiss. Posh! That's nothing more than a story from a penny dreadful. A curse? Now we're getting somewhere, said Manifold. What are we talking about here? Plagues? Flying cows? Despair! <laughs> what, sh- what sort of curse is that? For the record, I will put down as locusts. More dramatic, you see. The higher-ups love a good hullabaloo. Whatever you wish, Inspector, dismissed Phineas. Are we finished here? I really need to sleep. Yes, yes, I think that we can rule you out as a suspect for now. Manifold waggled a finger at him. But don't you be going anywhere. We might need to question you further. He turned to Mrs. Popkiss. Would seven in the morn be too early? That would be fine, replied the housekeeper, knowing full well what he meant. No, wailed Phineas in response. If you need to see me, you could come to the university. Now, take this lot and get out. Come on, all of you. This isn't a meeting house. Scooping up as much food as they can carry, the constables, William, and Abigail fled out of the house. Phineas stopped William as he passed and shoved a piece of paper into his breast pocket. Pick these up for me, if you will, and have them here by the time I wake up. William muttered something unintelligible through a pastry in his mouth and followed the others. Once the front door was closed, Phineas dragged himself up the stairs to his bedroom and collapsed. William had just left the university library. His arms were full of the books that Phineas had asked him to retrieve, and he grumbled that they all happened to be the largest in the library's collection. After passing a pastry shop and exerting a brief act of willpower by denying himself a look in the shop window, he stopped and turned slowly at an alley, reconsidering the merits of an afternoon snack. However, he never got the chance to act on his desires. Hans quickly grabbed the assistant, hauling him into the alley away from inquiring eyes. He was thrown up against the brickwork, causing him to lose his breath and drop the books. A gloved hand clamped over his mouth, and a pointy-faced man with very bad breath held him against the wall. "'Not a word, Mr. Patterson,' he said. "'Now, if you promise not to shout, I will remove my hand. If you decide to call for help, you might not like what happens next.' I just want to talk. Do you understand? William nodded his head, and the man stepped back. Once he was free, the first thing William did was cough and wave his hand in front of his face, trying to get the man's breath out of his nose. What do you want? Your friend, Professor Fracture, is playing with a new toy. We want it, and all of his research. And just who the devil are you? The man produced an identification paper, stating that his name was Lieutenant Farrington Thorne of the Imperial State Security, Division 5. "'You are the devil,' said William in a hushed tone. "'Some have called me that. They were all enemies of the Empire.' Thorne smiled wickedly. "'What do you know about Kavanaugh's mummy?' "'Nothing, I swear. I only saw him for a few minutes.' Phineas has been studying him. Kavanaugh's dead, though. Did did you kill him? We don't waste our time with trivial matters. The mummy is gone, and Fracture is the only one with knowledge of his inner workings. I don't know what to say. I I know nothing about this. I'm, I'm just his assistant. Not a very good one. Thorne sneered. He doesn't even let you in on what he's doing. And what do you do? You run for him, jump at his every command? You could be so much more than his lapdog. Faster than William's eyes could follow, Thorne's hand pulled open William's shirt, exposing the mutilated skin he'd received while in the Dolanite tank. 
Oh, you could be so much more, Mr. Patterson. We could fix that for you if you want. We can finish the process and make you better, stronger. A monster, you mean? Never. And if you think I would betray my friend for you, you're sadly mistaken, William said defiantly. Thorn leaned in close. Then you, we will have to take care of you another way. He held out his hand, and a soldier handed him a device that looked like a magnifying glass, with several wires wrapped around the framework. He flipped a switch on the handle, and several small lights began circling within the lens. Thorn held it up in front of William's eyes. Now, Mr. Patterson, you will remember nothing of this conversation until I decide to let you remember. As far as you are concerned, you tripped and fell into this alley. Is that understood? William's eyes lost their focus, and he answered, Yes. Good. Now you may wake up again as soon as we are gone. William shook his head and looked at the mess around him. Cursing his clumsiness, he picked up the books and straightened his shirt. I must be starving if I lost my balance so easily. Perhaps it was bad luck to pass up the shop after all. These tomes nearly broke my back, William complained as he dropped them on Phineas's desk. What do you need these for, anyway? Just some light reading, replied the professor. You never took an interest in ancient history before. Why now? Kavanaugh's dead, so there's no point in continuing with his request. It's not Kavanaugh that I'm interested in. It's Steamhodep. Why would you be interested in a murderous mummy? He didn't murder Kavanaugh. Not that I care who did, but it wasn't a desiccated corpse. And you know this how? Recall the pictures the inspector showed us. The measurements of the marks on Kavanaugh's throat match those of a standard pipe fitter's wrench. Steamotep's was a quarter of an inch smaller in width than that. Are you positive? Phineas rolled his eyes. Do you really need to ask that? Of course I'm positive. I have schematics. I spent the better part of the day taking measurements on him. Besides, the marks left on Kavanaugh's throat indicate that the wrench had teeth. The mummy's was flat. Whoever killed Kavanaugh didn't do a very good job at studying their alibi. Then who would want him dead? Take your pick. But that isn't my problem. It's the police's. No, my problem is what this does. Phineas tapped his finger on the drawing. Phineas tapped his finger on the drawing he had made of Stimotep's inner clockwork. This device, where the heart used to be, is completely foreign to me. William peered at the drawing. Well, just Egyptian, after all. Since that was where the heart was, could it possibly be some form of artificial heart? That would make the most sense. It would if it functioned like one. Hearts push blood. This pushes nothing. No blood, no fluid of any kind. Even automatons use some form of self-lubrication. This totally baffles me. I need that key. Which will do you no good without the mummy. That is the second order of business. We must find Kavanaugh's assistant, Burke. Look at our coats. You grab your pastries. Burke is dead? Inspector Manifold had stopped Phineas and William out. Inspector Manifold had stopped Phineas and William outside of Burke's apartment. Yes, he is. Another victim of the mummy's curse. There is no curse, said Phineas. How did he die? Same way. His throat was crushed. Where were you about four hours ago? Talking to you while you ate half of my pantry, and they ate the other half, Phineas said, indicating the loitering constables. Yes, well, right then. I guess that we can rule out you altogether. May we come in and view the body? I might be able to shed some light on this. So, now you're one of those penny detectives, eh? Well, by all means, shed your light. It's not like I haven't been doing this all my life. Please, by all means, come in. Wipe your chin, Inspector, Phineas said as he passed. You still have some sarcasm drooling off of it. The apartment was in total disarray. Bookshelves were knocked over, cushions were torn apart, and cabinets were emptied of their contents. 
The professor did a quick look around, barely observed the body, and then grabbed a hat from the hat stand. A wide-brimmed musketeer with a huge plume stuck in its band. He quickly put it on. Here's that hat I lent him, William. I'd hate to lose this on account of a murder. Very dashing, Phineas. But since when... Phineas hushed him quickly. Inspector, I believe that you should hurry. The mummy will strike again very soon. I am thinking that he will go after the tavern owner at the Five Mules, where Burke is known to frequent when he's in town. Come along, Patterson. We must make haste to our next call. Manifold watched them in wonder, and then turned to his men. Well, you heard him. Clean up this mess, and then get down to the Five Mules. Once they were clear, William grabbed Phineas by the arm. That was spectacular. How did you know about the tavern owner? I didn't. It was rubbish. I just wanted this hat, or, more to the point, what was in it. Phineas pulled out what William had assumed was a hat pin. However, it was much longer and much more ornamental. He tossed the hat aside and held up the object. The key? The key, repeated Phineas. Now see what you can find out about our missing mummy, and I'll get this to my lab and examine it. William started off down the street, when not more than a few seconds after leading when not more than a few seconds after leaving Phineas's side, he heard a yelp from Phineas's last direction of travel. Spinning on his heel, William raced back towards his friend, and found him sitting on the cobblestones, rubbing the back of his head. Phineas what happened? I've been jacked. The lad was waiting for me in the shadows and clubbed me as I passed by. He took the key. Big World Network.